And the unique thing about this story, I think in the big learning for us was about using sales velocity to help us organize and prioritize the types of things we did within our territory. So top tip for absolutely anybody who's thinking about doing prioritization, pull the list of all the opportunities, calculate the sales velocity, pair that with some other type of qualification data so that you can get a more complete picture and that will help make more obvious really what you should prioritize. The thing that made a difference is that I had a point of view and I was open-minded to going out and finding out whether or not it was really truly correct for my customer. So all those words implicating the pain, the decision criteria, the champion, the economic buyer, all of those are only important if you are generally, genuinely in a search for the truth to be able to find out whether or not your customer is gonna benefit from engaging with you. And if you can genuinely get to that truth, then you have all the power in the world to be able to ask for more, to use that to sell to your customer, to engage with them under their success metrics, and it makes all the other stuff when it comes to medic a lot easier. Hey everyone, this is Elite Dealers. My name is Pim, this is another episode and this one has been a, been a long time coming because it is with our very own Jake, who is now a member of our team. Welcome, Jake. Hey, Pim. Thanks for inviting me onto your show. Uh, I didn't know if it was a prerequisite to uh, me staying on the team or not, but happy to be here for an episode of Elite Dealers, whether or not it was secretly mandated or if it's just an awesome story that we get to talk about together. So yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, to be honest with you, Jake, I think it might be a little bit of both there, but uh, you know, we'll see. Hey, can you do like a very brief introduction for our, for our audience and then we'll get into it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jake Jeffries. I've been in enterprise sales about eight years. I've been using Medic for about the last four or five. The last four or five have been massively more successful than my first four or five. I actually started my career in sales, working in recruiting, when then transitioning into tech sales, now here uh, at Medic, the company. And I, I joined specifically because I'm a huge nerd for all things sales, love to get into the details of how things work, how to optimize, how to think about your best practices, how to scale that up with a team, how to organize your go-to-market team. And so for me, it's been really fun to be here at Medic, helping our customers do that every day. So here I am. I love the positive angle on being a nerd here and just obsess <laughs> over something to become the very best at it towards your own potential, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, right on. Hey, so this deal that we're going to talk about today, and I know there's a little bit of a, a pre-story to it, but can you give us like the high level statics? So like the, what does the customer do, deal size, sales cycle, that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. This is a fun deal for me because it was one of the very first and most memorable deals that I closed as in AE where I really learned how to call my shot, how to approach the deal with a more strategic mindset, how to think about you know the early inputs leading towards the end. So for me, this deal is really transformational in that it was the first of the, let's call the major deals that I started to close from then on out in my career. And so this deals with a large online retailer. Um, they're based out of the North here in the UK. We did the deal with a previous company, actually Andy White and I, the CEO of Medic Now, who both of us work really closely with and have a good time with. Uh, he also was my leader at the time. And the unique thing about this story, I think in the big learning for us was about using sales velocity to help us organize and prioritize the types of things we did within our territory. So for us, uh, this online retailer, which we closed for a total contract value of about a million uh, over a two year deal, which was a major landmark deal for our customers here in Europe. and was also really significant because it was the first case study that we were able to use to start to produce a whole sector of new customers in this region that help us really define the region and remain the largest customer for quite some time thereafter. So it was really instrumental from that perspective too. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that one comment, Andy, probably made you say that, right? No, just kidding. Yes. But, <laughs> but um, it's it's with, with MedPick and qualification, we typically say something along the lines of focusing on the right things in the right deals. But I guess your story with regards to the sales velocity equation goes back to focusing on the right accounts. Is that is that accurate? Yes, definitely. And I would say, you know, thinking about this conversation today, one of the top tips that I would have for AEs, uh, sales managers, even sales ops or territory planners, people who you're thinking about 
organizing a list coming up for the year, how to prioritize what to do in the remaining half of the quarter. What we did that worked really well was pulled the list of all of the deals that had been closed in the enterprise segment in the US and in Europe. We used those raw figures to calculate sales velocity. So the number of opportunities multiplied by the percentage of those deals, which were successfully closed one multiplied by the amount that those deals were closed one on average divided by the time that it took. And that score was a really interesting insight when you start to pair it with the industry level data. So what industries tend to have really high sales velocity, what size of company, what size of account. And so using qualification data beyond just the kind of basic size data to be able to organize ourselves around sales velocity. After running that exercise, Andy and I found out that uh, in our business, online retailers and quick serve restaurants specifically had the biggest return on sales velocity. And primarily we had been targeting big banks, financial organizations like the major tech companies like an Amazon or an Apple. There were so many different behemoth tech companies that we were going after that we didn't really recognize where we were getting the best return for our time. And so those two industries quickly stood out as the opportunity for us to go in and do really significantly sized deals and start to answer some of those questions like why are they the sales velocity that tends to be the best? And that's where Medic was really helpful in kind of instrumenting that filling the gaps and understanding the landscape from there. So top tip for absolutely anybody who's thinking about doing prioritization, pull the list of all the opportunities, calculate the sales velocity, pair that with some industry, some other type of qualification data so that you can get a more complete picture. And that will help make more obvious really what you should prioritize. Yeah, I love that. And that is really helping towards creating your ideal prospect profile as well, right? As you plan uh, for the year. And I think that this might be a nice segue into this specific deal. Um, having done that as preparation for your uh, account set at the time and kind of redefining that, what was the increased sales velocity as a result later on? Oh, man. Uh, well, Let's say our average deal size that I was shooting for when I started doing this, when I remember doing sales velocity, it couldn't have been more than 50,000 US dollars. The average deal size of the deals that I was hunting for in my um, new sales velocity equation was in between 150 to 250,000 was kind of our sweet spot. And then we had an additional tier up above that where we were really fighting for the 500,000 to a million. And so we had a whole new system playbook and approach going from doing any $50,000 deal that we could do down to categorizing and accurately forecasting against which 100 and 250 and which 500 plus are going to close and when throughout the year. So sales velocity was massively impacted by not only just performing better by doing better, but actually having the confidence to know that these are going to come in around this quarter. These are going to come in around this quarter. And because we could see those you know, process elements ahead of time. Yeah, and I like the sales velocity equation for that, right? It's like planning ahead, focusing on the right accounts, but then also once you have it and you translate it to the MedPIC framework, it's like, okay, if we if we now understand that we need to do a better job at qualifying and building uh, champions, for example, when we now do it, like how much does it impact our sales velocity, right? So it's something that you can use in planning, but you can also use it retrospectively. And as you start making improvements and look back at how much better you did because of that, as you start gearing up for the next uh, kind of step towards, you know, the respective level of sales excellence. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of things will correlate to sales velocity ultimately like deal size, time to close, there's so many different factors. But what we found to be successful is just using that as a guidance to be able to put ourselves in the right situation so that you know that at the very least you're selling to a customer that has some really great referenceable stories, a reason to care about your unique decision criteria, a group of other people who sit in their industry, in their area, who can tell them about the things that matter to them in these areas, the pain that they've solved for. And at the very least, when you approach them, you have a level of confidence around that. So you're automatically going to get higher returns on your time if you're having a same or similar conversation. In, and maybe people don't have the luxury to do it in one single industry, but maybe you call your shot on two or three and you start to look at building your account strategy around those high velocity engagements and then repeating those results from there. Awesome. Okay, well, let's dive into this specific deal then, because that's right on top of the, the kind of categories that you were talking about there, right? With 500K in ARR. 
Um, how did it come about? So it originally started kind of an interesting engagement. So we, I think looking back, would have done so many things differently. But one of the things that I would not have changed for the world is um, the way that this engagement kind of kicked off initially. So what happened was our SDR, a gentleman named Yusuf, who excellent, has gone on to be excellently successful now, is actually leading the team um, at Branch. And what he did was reach out with a really specific guided screenshot led kind of user experience of something that was breaking from their social media platform to their mobile app. And so it was showing a really huge and unique decision criteria underneath what we could help to solve for that we knew about, which was user experience. And so the response to this message, which was super personal and had like their kind of flow built into it was, why don't you guys just come down to Manchester and show us your stuff? Great. So, <laughs> so you rock up in Manchester, I suppose. So we roll, so we roll up to Manchester uh, and have the first meeting in person, which was, I suppose, this was er end of 2019, so it wasn't totally unheard of for us to do at this time. And so we have this first meeting in person in this like old janky building. It's like in a weird like warehouse there. It's a family owned business and they are like a kind of historical and so they have a little bit of a historical feel to all of their buildings this was definitely before it was all updated and before a lot of the growth of the company and so this was like a, a really interesting first meeting we're like in the back cavern room presenting our screenshots and our stuff and i think what was interesting about that first meeting and in hindsight what we really learned is that we found out that the business case that they were building was different than the one that we had in mind in hindsight, we were focused on user experience, flash features. What they were focused on is the value that the data could bring them and really uniquely how they could use that to help to optimize their own conversion rate and the other things which eventually kind of floated up through the organization, which put their web conversion rate like on the front page of their annual. So if, if you think about that, you only get to understand that through building um building up your your stakeholders right and getting like a champion so that they work with you and and by the way shout out to Yusef for first setting this up right that's a very cool story yeah always love if yeah. deals kind of start like that so that's awesome but so it, it this initial meeting like and the, the the stakeholders that you were meeting at at the time how would you now put them into stakeholder categories if we look at metric as a framework the the benefit the the one of the reasons that this went really well is because we met a a qualified champion early on, or we met uh, someone who had the potential to be a champion from the very first meeting. That was the person who responded. This person had power and influence. We later really found that they had a vested interest in our success and partially because our success was the success of their conversion rate, which was the metric he was wholly responsible for. And also because he was currently running um, four out of the 13 or 14 brands. And they were the biggest, but he definitely had a larger ambitions and, and saw this product as a really good way to drive the solution in the right direction and kind of saw the innovation behind it. So this person was vested in our success and they were selling internally on our behalf because they really knew the other directors. They helped us navigate the executive board. This was someone who had the ear of the family to enough of a degree that we was able to get our proposal passed through. So they, that, little, sorry, the, the heir of the family, that sounds a little bit like a scene from the straight out of the Godfather. Yeah, yeah it's, like, <laughs> it's not that cool, I don't think. Um, maybe, maybe the, hopefully they don't hear this and know what I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> definitely, I definitely think it was, uh, it was the type of person that we were dealing with from the start who was a qualified champion. And unbeknownst to me at the time, in the very early stages, I would have taken lots of meetings with you know a lot of people. In hindsight, making sure that you can double down on doing those well is the most important thing in sales because that deal could have been seen from a lot further out knowing that you know this is where we were dealing all right jake so that so that makes sense and so if you think about the personalization that you mentioned this is what typically earns you the right to ask more questions but also builds a potential champion up into an actual champion so that they start coaching you on how to win and that's a little bit of what i'm i'm sensing here when you say like hey the use case that we prepared for was kind of solid but it was slightly different than what they were actually looking to solve for is that is that right is it yeah we we, we learn more over time and in those the important part about the early interactions was we were building them as a champion by being a good partner to work with we were willing to take the meeting in person we showed up very prepared 
we had really thoroughly thought through the user side of their experiences. We didn't necessarily understand to every degree their specific problems. Um, and actually, we learned a lot more that we used later on. But because this was a new customer category for us, it was most helpful in the way that we built the champion early on was really showing up super prepared, making sure that we were always thinking about how we were adding value at every stage. Because of that, we really bought the opportunity to ask more of those challenging questions. And it started to come later in the process where our champion introduced the fact that the data was the most interesting part of the engagement when we just simply asked. So how do we see the measurement of the value of this partnership? We started to talk about the value cases and they gave us a couple of different answers and different reasons, which we then iterated on and started to build into this really simple model of conversion rate. And so for us, it was just about building them by being good to work with, which is simple advice, but sometimes can get neglected, sending an agenda in advance, doing your prep work, showing up on time, ending on time, making sure that the things that you say have them in mind and aren't purely to your own gain. And so all of these things helped us get a little bit of space to be able to ask those other questions and how is our solution uniquely positioned for you? And so they started to give us a lot of that feedback. So if you, if you think about the pain that you uncovered by well, positioning other value that you had delivered successfully for other customers that was slightly removed from that. Did you then uncover pain that they were already looking to solve for? Like, was it an active project or was this completely spun up from, well, you guys engaging with them to begin with? What we did really well is we made the metric the center of the project. And so the metric improving conversion rate was a larger initiative because frankly, that is what e-commerce businesses do. So that's a business as usual, high priority function at any given time. And any business case that's pressed against improving conversion rate is also going to help. So for us, having that become the central metric that we anchored ourselves against was an enormous way, enormously easy way to get ourselves a kind of any time if your conversion rate is down, then you are going to lose money on a daily basis. So that created a lot of urgency around the project, which kind of ironically came to came to a little bit of a head later, which we'll get into. But that um, that change in the um, focus on the the kind of initiative itself made made it that they knew that the data could help them do that. And every use case we built just became a more and more powerful way for us to be one partner that can help them solve a whole host of challenges, all of which will contribute to improving your conversion rate in these measurable ways. So how did you go about that not having uh, a big foothold in this specific uh, segment or industry just yet and, and having like, like, you know, a, a lot of other brands, but not necessarily something comparable? Well, I think it was them having trust in what we were saying is true. And, and it was a pretty painstaking review process to prove to um, this one individual from the marketing team who did not report directly to our champion, but was in the other department that we needed to bring on board with us. So the group marketing director was kind of a secondary champion. And so this person who reported to them was a huge blocker, would call us at like eight, 9 p.m. would send me these like 40 page Jake this is not working I am pulling the plug like type of text messages where she's like not the person who can can do that even and so you get into this really challenging scenario where you have to make sure that the technical requirements are covered but also we don't lose sight of the business opportunities and because we were working with a real champion because we had a strong business case around the met the business impact that we can have all of the technical blockers became is that business critical to stopping us from achieving our mission? Yes or no? If yes, do we have a workaround, a solution, or are we going to call in almost in every one of those that came up? We were able to show that we have a workaround or a solution. And so it's not going to stop us from reaching that ultimate um, impact objective, which made the whole process a lot easier. So, so at what point in the cycle would you say that the decision criteria really started to become clearer and, you know, by way of influencing as well through the relationship that you had built with your champion there? The, the perfect kind of like the perfect storm of medic for me is when you can influence, when you can take a customer's decision criteria and actually influence the way that you deliver your solution to fit that even more so than having the decision criteria that they need the most. 
And so in this case, what happened was we worked backwards from their need to have this multiple influencer, multiple platform strategy. And this was what we found out digging into online retailers. That was the unique element of delivering that solution, which ultimately was so successful. And the unique decision criteria was companies who have a multiple influencer, multiple platform strategy had specific problems with setting up and managing the links and measuring their success on the web and in the app. So they didn't really know how those dollars were being spent. And so ultimately they were investing huge amounts of money. It was hugely complicated and annoying to deal with, and they weren't really seeing the return on that. And when it comes to marketing, you want to make sure that you can track everything that you spend. And so for us, we had a solution so that they could link all the people appropriately, collect all the tracking data, optimize their conversion rate. And so all of these systems came together in a way that that was the unique decision criteria. Any solution that couldn't bring that influencer strategy to a hold from a linking and a measurement perspective wasn't enough to be considered a solution in this category. And it was necessary because we showed that doing this would drive hundreds of millions of people to the right place to order through the app at a higher value and to the point where they'll receive in the case of, I believe our last business case showed that we directly impacted in the range of 100 million to 200 million in total revenue on like a monthly basis. So it turned out to be enormously successful. That, that's massive. And so if you talk about getting deeper and wider, that's that's all, you know, in, in that journey there. So your economic buyer and getting access there, how did that work in this deal? That was challenging because I mentioned a few times that it's a family owned business. There was a CEO at the time, but the CEO and the CFO and the family had a policy that they didn't really meet with outside vendors. And so that would have been enormously challenging. We would have, um, pro pro we, we would have had to either force calling off the deal or have really called a hissy fit in order to get in front of them. So it was one of those scenarios that we had to get a little bit creative. And so what was helpful here is as we got wider in the account, our champion introduced us to his two peers, the group finance director and the group marketing director. So we had finance, marketing and e-commerce, the three main departments who interact with our solution and then the finance team to be able to support the kind of ROI and the other backing of it. And so those came together to really help us put together a business case, which was based on the impact that we could have. They're coaching us very deeply to win on what the family are gonna care about the metrics that they're going to want to see. We ran a small test pilot to make sure that it worked. And we showed that in that couple of weeks, there was definitely an opportunity. We showed that it was lightweight in terms of implementation. So they gave us everything that we needed to put together an amazing overview business case. Uh, and <laughs> I think our feedback, <clears throat> so first a funny story. When I went to go present that in that meeting, actually to the group finance director and the e-commerce director, um, maybe like six, seven months, no, it's five months in the UK at this point, I'm running across the road because my train was late, look the other way because cars drive on the right side of the road. And uh, it wasn't, it was coming from the other direction and I got smashed by, luckily it was a bicycle. So I like knock my like headphones off my head. They still have the scratch on them. It's still like a big scratch on the side. I showed up to the meeting like minorly, I must've been minorly concussed. Uh, later, actually, one of the engineers on the project was like, oh, yeah, Andrew said he saw you that day and you're acting kind of weird. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Battle scars, Jake. No, no one ever mentioned it. I didn't really think about it uh, until later. And yeah, I realized that like that was actually quite a monumental <laughs> moment in that deal when I was potentially going to go off the rails concussed. But it worked out. They didn't turn us down. So... Yeah, no, absolutely. So, hey, you, you shared a lot about uh, stakeholders. And what I like is that you're constantly speaking from a perspective of like, we did this and we did that. Because like bringing a deal like this home is really a team sport, right? So on your side of this um, engagement, like what did it look like from a stakeholder's perspective in terms of like multi-threading, et cetera, to make all of this work? Yeah, so a couple of key lines was first uh, the champion feeling comfortable with our company and so we had when the coo came out to fly out i and this is a, you know advice to sales reps like take advantage of those opportunities don't hide behind when your leader's in town and they ask for some meetings to go to because not everyone's raising their hands and if you have good meetings especially or interesting meetings, you'd be surprised, you know, the feedback you can get if a well-run, you know, COO meeting shows up. So because our COO was in town, we met them at their uh, London offices. They came down to the London office specifically to talk to him. We got a little tour of their kind of operation down there, heard a lot of interesting insight about the exec board. 
talked about <clears throat> those different challenges and that kind of, and so there always felt like there was kind of a release valve that happened above me. And so I could use that channel as a really effective way to communicate. The other thing that was really important was making sure that our solutions engineer had a really clear line to the technical team. And so there was a, a challenging technical blocker. There was an implementation team, a kind of mobile apps and an engineering team. And so all these different forces who need to work with each other. This solutions engineer, who's um, amazing, his name is Oleg. I believe he also runs the team uh, at Branch now still. He built a solution to their specific decision criteria. And knowing it or not knowing it, I believe we used that terminology at the time. Medic was newer to us, but we really now understand that we built something that was a unique decision criteria for branch and that led us to go out and find other companies who care about using this tool that oleg built which ended up being copied across the rest of the company ended up closing deals across the world using this little strategy that you know between yusuf oleg andy and myself came up with and built off the back of sales velocity and so that is a really good way to kind of turn it into um, a success story that has repeatability and scalability to it. And the technical line and the executive line were really important kind of multi-threading elements to get that done. Yeah, awesome. Love that story with, with Oleg as well. And would you say that in this deal, he had like a secondary champion, um, you know, next to like your main champion? Because this this typically comes up in this episode with where the best deals sometimes have a, a bit a bit of a dramatic turn and it's like oh are we actually are we out are we done with each other or are we still you know um uh, progressing yeah and, and so having an se that is that is going out there building that same sort of relationship on a technical level will build redundancy into you know into your engagement was that going on with with Oleg and the technical yeah. yeah absolutely i mean what what that did was it made it very clear that if the team were going to choose to do anything they were going to choose not to work with us and to do something completely different they weren't going to try to build what we had and they weren't going to work with another vendor because the technical criteria of what our solution offered was unique and it specifically solved that and so having the technical person, someone like Oleg, to be able to manage that aspect of the conversation, that was really successful because it gave them everything that they need to feel comfortable in recommending us as a solution. And it made our job on the sales side a lot easier because we could point to that and say, okay, well, the business impact is, rel is, is only dependent on achieving these same technical criteria that we already deemed are necessary. And so these two things are connected. We can't separate them as much as it's nice to when you want to when they want to do that at the end during the negotiation part. And so for us, it helped us stick to the value of the deal. Uh, we this deal happened, as I said, end of March, uh, end of 2019, uh, early 2020. So we got the call that a lot of reps did around March 14th, which was COVID is shutting down our business. We don't know what we're going to do. Our deal is definitely off. Our close date was March 31st. That was the end of Q1 for me. And so that end of Q1 deal is not even on the table. We don't know what's going to happen. You, you got that actual message in this in this very sales cycle. Yeah, yeah. So in this sales cycle in March uh, of 2020, this deal was supposed to close on March 31st. We had done all that stuff, done the approval. The EB meeting was already scheduled, but they had given like a kind of pre thumbs up. Contracts were ready, reviewed, redlined. Like we had done literally everything. And the last minute curveball was, you know, the 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 world shutting down momentarily. And so when everything shut down, we got that call to say, hey, we, we don't think we can do the deal anymore. I was distraught. Uh, but at the same time, it was kind of interesting because it was like no one knew what was going to happen whatsoever. And that hadn't, it was not the only deal I got that call on. What we were fortunate in is that this company pivoted pretty quickly from selling kind of like going out stuff to like pajamas. And they did amazingly well. And so th literally like three weeks later, two or three weeks later during the lockdown, they called me and said, hey, we're back on. We got to spin that up. How can we get that going? Is there a way to do the implementation virtually? Is there a way to sign that? Like, can we make things? Because our business case was so strong because they still had traffic that they needed to convert. We ultimately found a way to implicate the pain in such a way that even a scary market opportunity, which was a headwind for a lot of companies for them kind of became a tailwind and pushed them up and into the sales. And so 
that was a really, really scary part of the deal that ultimately wasn't that big of a deal because in hindsight, it worked out pretty well. Uh, and it turned out to be that landmark deal that I talked about early on and was really instrumental in me going out to close maybe in the next six months, two or three more customers like it in that almost exact same deal cycle, much faster, much more simple uh, using the tools that we had already built. And so that kind of became my sign off um, as I left that organization. And that really was like the, the, um, the opportunity that we had pursued. So it, it became, a, became quite a nice case study of how we could go out and kind of call our shot influence the decision criteria, use that to connect with the champion, get engaged with the economic buyer and close like a significant deal over and over again. Well, I mean, what a story, some some significant events throughout, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, a few curve, curveballs there. So, you know, top down, I think uh, we've heard about the personalization and the prep that you Yousef did to, to, you know, land the meeting in the first place. Personalization, key always, right? Then learning about sales velocity, understanding your IPP better through that and focusing not only on the right things in the right deals, but on the right accounts to begin with. Um, utilizing the wider team to get deeper and wider into the account. I think there's some best practice on the basis of that. For example, with uh, your SC being building like the, the secondary champion there, right? And the re resiliency within the, the stakeholders um, of, the, of the engagement. Um, I think, you know, that last thing that you just said there around like uh, headwinds becoming tailwinds is a really interesting one also from a mindset point of view, right? So as we kind of summarize that, is, is there like one more thing that you really took away from this whole engagement that you would want to share with our audience today as a, as a takeaway? Yeah, um, this, the thing that made a difference is that I had a point of view and I was open-minded to going out and finding out whether or not it was really truly correct for my customer. So all those words implicating the pain, the decision criteria, the champion, the economic buyer, all of those are only important if you are generally, genuinely in a search for the truth to be able to find out whether or not your customer is going to benefit from engaging with you. And if you can genuinely get to that truth, then you have all the power in the world to be able to ask for more, to use that to sell to your customer, to engage with them under their success metrics. And it makes all the other stuff when it comes to medic a lot easier. So so that's like the, the, the kind of mindset thing that we sometimes speak about with customers, especially like on kickoffs, et cetera. Oh, it's like, okay, do you have the mindset of like, is there a deal for me here? Or do we truly know whether we can deliver value? If we're not sure, let's find out. And, and make it happen, right? That's, exactly. That's, that's yeah, this whole, this whole thing started because we thought about which customers can we provide the most value to relative to our own sales velocity. And those two segments, the other segment became quick serve restaurants. And for Branch, that also quickly became one of the top segments of the organization as a result of the value that they could provide to their customers using a slightly different approach to the solution, which had slightly different decision criteria, pain, metrics, champions, but more or less was a repeatable and scalable sales process that was led to by that you know initial search for the truth around what our best sales velocity is. So that's my really basic advice and go out and dig into the data have some fun with it. Uh, it can be a little bit more fun to call your shot and to be able to use that, those deals that, to be able to work in those deals that you feel confident in rather than kind of searching for uh, whether or not you can get a deal done. Yeah, so, so what advice would uh, you give your 10 years younger self if you could right now? Yeah. If I could give myself, if I could give myself sales advice, sales career advice, I would say focus on finding a company where you can have a really lasting impact that has a good product market fit and a good growth trajectory trajectory specifically a company that's going to help you improve your skills and going to invest in your training so that you can become more successful the other piece of advice i would give to myself is don't take it too seriously just have fun. <laughs> yeah, it all works good. out and there's another quarter coming it is it is a little bit it is a little bit less of a big deal than you think it is uh 10 years ago jake that's for sure. And I think by taking it a little bit slower, I've started to learn so much faster over the last couple of years, using Medic as a common language, identifying those opportunities for my own development and just going out and owning them makes it so much more fun too. So just go and do that. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. You've been 
you know, you've been just uh, awesome on this call. Thanks for taking the time and sharing all those valuable insights uh, with us today. And that concludes yes, another um, another episode of Elite Dealers. And uh, with that, we're going to um, look forward to, uh, to the next one. But for now, uh, see you soon.